Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. What's your New Year's resolution this year? Maybe it's to exercise more, save money, or learn a new skill. Whatever your goal, you need tools and tactics to help you identify and overcome the barriers to change. Katie Milkman is an award-winning professor at Wharton and host of the popular podcast, Choiceology. She's devoted her career to studying behavior change, and now she's sharing it all with us in her book, How to Change. In our conversation today, Katie reveals a science-based approach that can take you from where you are to where you want to be. We talk about why change is hard, when the best time to change is, and how to overcome the common barriers to change. Whether you're a manager, coach, or leader aiming to help others change for the better, or you're struggling to kickstart change yourself, this is a conversation for you. All right. Well, Katie, thanks for joining. This is going to be fun. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) So tell me this, right? Why is change so hard? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, the unfortunate answer is because there are so many forces that are working against us. And of course, what I focus on in my research is the internal forces. There's external forces too that make change hard, right? And I'm not even going to go there. But imagine you have everything set up in the world to facilitate change. Just the way you're built, your psychology uh, is working against you. So everything from the fact that we are built to be sort of efficiency-loving machines who take the path of least resistance, which I call laziness. (laughs) But it's, you know, it's a, it's a feature, not a flaw, but it, it makes change hard to, um, and that's part of why we're creatures of habit, to the fact that we focus more on the instant gratification we get from something than the long-term rewards. Again, that's the way we're wired to focus on that. Does it feel good? Does it taste good now? Much more than what are those long-term consequences uh, to forgetfulness because our memory capacity is only, you know, finite. And the fact that we're social and so we follow the herd and look to others for examples and sometimes that pushes us in dangerous directions or directions that are counter to what would be in our long-term best interest. We lack confidence in our abilities in many situations. All of those forces push us away from making positive change in life. So that's why it's so hard. And I ended up writing this book about like, what are all those barriers and what are the scientifically proven things to help us overcome those particular challenges? Sure, sure. And I want to dig into all of those. What would you say is the biggest misconception or maybe myth would be a way to think about it that people believe about change that isn't actually true? Hmm. I think the myth that drives me the most nuts is right. that you know, like, there's there's so many. I don't know what the biggest is. The one that, that bothers me the most, though, is that there's a single solution. That there's a sort of one size fits all winning approach. That if you just, you know, I don't want to knock any particular person down, but like you know, there's all these different different pe- people with different things that they're pushing from sort of visualizing success to a certain formula for a habit building program to uh, um, set a big audacious goal. And each focuses on just their one tool. And while there are a lot of different tools that evidence suggests can be useful, and all the ones I listed, there, there are things we can do to build better habits. There are things we can do to set goals more effectively. It can be helpful to think positively in some situations, though it can also be helpful to think negatively. But none of those is the one size fits all. It depends on the situation. And it depends on what the barriers are in your specific context. Like, why are you making these specific changes? It can be really different from one person to another. Or if you're trying to make financial change versus physical fitness change versus career change, 
And I think the fact that we are sort of inundated with like, here's my formula, here's my idea. So many people give that to, that drives me crazy because the evidence really does not support a single one size fits all kind of solution. It depends what works. And in the book, you talk about the barriers and, you know, you talk about sort of seven and you just referred to it, internal barriers to change. You know, you talk about getting started, impulsivity, right? Procrastination, forgetfulness, laziness, confidence, conformity. You know, so I want to kind of dig into each of these, right? I mean, you're a researcher, right? By nature, I want to dig into the research and the data that you've dug into, because as you said, there's so many myths about how we navigate change. Why is timing so important when it comes to making change, right? What's the science behind you know, why fresh starts work? Yeah, I love that you started there. And this is one of my favorite things that I have ever studied. It actually started thinking about timing and why it would matter because I was working with Google and talking to some of their top executives about problems that they wanted to overcome at the organization. And I got this amazing question after I'd presented a bunch of research on different tools we could use to encourage change. And the question was, when should we offer them up? You know, like, is there some ideal time to say to our employees, oh, here's a new wellness program. Here's a new financial planning um, option. You know, here's a productivity hack or here's a bunch of, you know, new coding languages you can learn through this new program. They were just curious, is, does timing matter? And it was like this light bulb moment because I realized the research literature honestly didn't have an answer, but of course timing had to matter. Like, how could it not? How could there not be moments when we were more motivated than others? And so my collaborators and I started digging in. And what we found is that both from reading past research, we sort of put this theory together and then doing lots of testing to evaluate its validity. What we found is that there are moments and the moments that seem to be most opportune for change are moments that feel like new beginnings in our lives or fresh starts. You know, one of them that we all, nobody needs a researcher to tell you about is, is New Year's, right? New Year's resolutions, that there's a fresh start feeling. You get that sense of a clean slate on January 1. You can look back and say, you know, last year mistakes, that was the old me, the new me, you believe can do it. So you have this sense of optimism and the ability to set aside failure from the past and also so you tend to do more big picture thinking at those moments. But what we've shown is it's not just New Year's. That's the one we're all familiar with. But these new beginnings and fresh starts, they arise actually a lot in life. So everything from the start of a new week can give us that fresh start effect to celebration of a birthday, the start of a new month, sometimes taking a holiday break will do it. Even the transition to a new season, if it's called to your attention, can be enough to motivate people to feel like, okay, I have a new beginning and I'm more interested in change. And we've shown this in you know, data set after data set happening naturally, that people seek out change at these moments. So Google searches for the term diet, when people visit the gym, when they set goals on popular goal setting websites, but also in experiments where we give people the opportunity and to pursue change. And, and we randomly assign them to groups that either highlight special dates on the calendar as a time when they could change or don't. And, and all of those studies, we see this pattern where fresh starts motivate change. Well, and it really also plays into your point that it's not one silver bullet, right? That it's not one thing because we know the data around New Year's resolutions is not great, right? That it doesn't always stick because it needs to be more than just that, right? For Absolutely. that change to stick. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, my, the work I've done on the Fresh Start Effect is some of the work I've done that's sort of gotten the most media attention and pick up. And every, every New Year's, I do a lot of interviews. And so a bunch of people who I knew sort of expected when I wrote a book about change that it would be a book about Fresh Starts and, you know, I laughed in response <laughs> because I was like, well, but that's that can only be the first chapter. The problem with first starts is they get you started and then they, you know, they leave you flailing if you don't have a good toolbox of other strategies to get you beyond the, you know, <laughs> beyond the starting line. You have to get all the way to the finish line. So that motivation helps you, but then you need to use the right tactics to get from from you know, motivated and ready to start something to actually succeeding. Well, and I would imagine fresh starts don't always have to be something positive per se, right? Or could, I mean, for example, could it look like something, you know, like COVID as a fresh start? I mean, do you think COVID will cause long-term changes, right, that stick? And, and if so, maybe why or, or, or maybe why not? Yeah, it's a really great question. And, um, and it is interesting because, of course, when we wrote and named this the fresh start effect, we we gave it a positive name as opposed to the disruption effect, which it 
would probably be just as apt of a title given the data we had. And the data really what it shows is when you feel like you're entering a new chapter in life, when you feel like, you know, one door is closed and another is opened, that gives you a sense that it's an opportune time to change. And so there's nothing that says it has to have a positive connotation, whatever causes that chapter break. But we also haven't studied explicitly things like, you know, what happens when your spouse suddenly dies, for instance, like the kind of the worst kinds of disruptions that life could have that closes one chapter and opens another, but it's a, you know, it's maybe the death of a child would be worse, but it's, you know, it's up there, right? There's these horrible tragedies that we go through, but they are chapter breaks. I don't have great data on whether or not you still get the positive effects. A lot of the theory, though, still applies, which is to say that you would have that sense that a chapter is closing, another is opening, which would probably make you do big picture thinking. It may disrupt your routines, which leads to an opportunity to create change. It probably makes you feel distinct from who you were before. So, uh, you know, theoretically, the same patterns should happen. And I, I do think COVID somewhere in between, like, you know, the worst possible thing that could ever happen to you and a more normal type of fresh start that I've written about historically, it certainly comes with the features that would make me think it's going to lead to some lasting change. Got it. How does present bias, right, or impulsivity, if you will, hinder our ability to change? Yeah, great question. So this is one of the things I was mentioning earlier that's working against us, this tendency to focus on those short-term rewards. Does it taste good? Does it feel good? You know, will I enjoy it right now? And we overweight that relative to long-term payoffs. And that's, you know, why we reach for the second or seventh slice of pizza. I shouldn't say second, (laughs) right? Uh, You know, even when we didn't intend to, and when we have some other goal that's not aligned with that, or why we spend a paycheck quickly on a a night out and then later regret it, what, you know, whatever it might be, the, the indulgences that we later regret a lot of that can be attributed to present bias. So it's this really pernicious problem that we need to be aware of when we're trying to make change because it fights against us. It's most of the things that we set goals to do that we know we should do are unfortunately counteracted by present bias, right? Like saving for retirement, getting in shape, not yelling at your kids or your your partner or your colleagues when something goes wrong. Those are all present biases working against you when you try to set those kinds of goals. So it's a big barrier. And you talk about temptation bundling that can help us combat impulsivity. What are some of the things that you recommend people do to sort of combat this? Yeah, the research gives us sort of two toolboxes, I would say, for tackling impulsivity. And by the way, I think of the flip side of impulsivity as procrastination, because due to impulsivity, you put off doing the good things. So there's sort of two tactics we can use. One tactic is make it so that it's actually instantly gratifying to do the thing that's good for you. So transform the behavior that's normally a drag into a pleasure. Um, I call it sort of the Mary Poppins approach. And there's really wonderful research out of the University of Chicago by Ayelet Fishbach and Caitlin Woolley, who's now at Cornell, showing if we do something that's counterintuitive to most of us, which is when we're trying to pursue a goal, look for the way to do it that will be the most fun, we actually persist longer than if we do what's a more natural approach most of us take, which is like try to find the most efficient and effective way to get to the end goal. But that often neglects to think about the experience in the moment and that momentary experience, right? Like if if the workout you're trying to do is miserable, you will not do it a second time. But if it's fun, you went to Zumba class with your friends, now you'll actually come back to the gym. So persistence is important. And one of the ways I've studied of making it fun and so by doing something I call temptation bundling, and that is literally linking something you enjoy that's hedonically excite, you know, gratifying in the moment with the activity that is a bit of a chore. So to stick with sort of the exercise domain that this can be used in other settings too, uh, I actually first temptation bundled by only letting myself indulge in certain kinds of entertainment at the gym, right? Like you can only allow yourself to binge watch your favorite Netflix show while you're exercising. And now you start looking forward to the gym to find out what happens next. And you don't feel guilt while you're watching the show. Maybe you waste less time outside of the gym watching it when you should be doing other things. Or you can, you know, only pick up your favorite snack or or beverage while you're that's maybe not super healthy while you're heading to the library to hit the books if you're a student or only listen to your favorite podcast while you're doing household chores or drink a glass of red wine while cooking a fresh meal for your family so there's all these different ways we can 
temptation bundle to make it more instantly gratifying to do what's good for us in the long run. And that counters present bias by basically putting it to work for you. So that's one way. And then anyway, we can talk about the other side if you want to, which is... Please, yes. Okay, well, so the way one that we just sort of discussed for tackling present bias is make it more instantly gratifying. And and there's some tools for doing it. The other way is make it more costly if you don't do it, right? And this is like, this is what the policymaker who's setting speed limits and fining us if we if we drive too fast knows and is using to try to change our behavior in so many settings right like rules bans fines that are created by organizations or governments typically say like we're going to use the stick to prevent you from you know taking heroin or driving too fast whatever you know whatever it is they want to prevent you from doing you might be tempted to do it's not good for society what's weird is we normally don't think about creating similar sets of constraints boundaries and fines for ourselves when we want to create goals or achieve goals. But research shows that it can be really effective and powerful to do so. So um, let me give you an example study I love that was done to try to help people save more. And this this was done in the Philippines. Um, People were offered two types of bank accounts, either a bank account where they could put money with a standard interest rate and take it in and and withdraw whenever they wanted, or a second kind of bank account, a locked account that actually had the exact same interest rate, but you wouldn't be allowed to take your money out until you'd reached a predetermined savings date or savings goal. And the idea is like, well, there's two ideas. One, some people go, why would anyone do that? That's crazy. Like there's no interest rate. You're going to give the bank your money for no benefit and not have access to it. So it's illiquid. That's bad. But The benefit is if you're tempted to dip into it, you actually can't because you've constrained yourself. And so about 30% of people offered this second kind of account actually put money in it because they recognize the benefits of being able to tie their hands and not dip into savings. And what's more fascinating is in a randomized control trial where some people were offered this type of account and others were only offered the standard type, um, just having access to it you know, no one's forced to put money, access to it increased savings 80% year over year for individuals. So finding ways that you can make it, you know, harder to dip into savings or to engage in a behavior you know is not good for you can be really powerful. Cash commitments are another form where like you could only, you can put money on the line that you'll forfeit if you fail to achieve a goal. So you're basically fining yourself if you don't do it. Research shows that can help As well, there's a great smoking cessation study where people who could put money on the line, they're randomly assigned to get access to an account they could put money in, and they'd have to forfeit it six months later if they had if they fail a nicotine or cotinine urine test, they quit at 30% higher rates than others. So that's sort of the stick side. We can penalize ourselves, constrain ourselves as well, and that can help with present bias. Wow, that's interesting. That's cool. I mean, obviously. It sounds sort of like an executive with golden handcuffs too, right? That's what keeps them there because <laughs> they got a little exactly. pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, yes, right? Yes, that's exactly right. It's it's and it's it's like we know we understand incentives, right? We understand sure. using incentives to change the behavior of other people, the people we're employing, or um, but we don't typically think of turning them on ourselves when we have a goal, and they can be really useful once you understand some of the barriers to achieving your goals. If you create the right incentive structure, it can help you. Well, I like the math on this too, right? So we, we have three daughters. I mean, I could just, you know, if instead of when you clean your room, you get five bucks, right? When you don't clean your room, I fine you, right? I mean, it sounds like the math on that could work well for me. <laughs> That's right. So in that, in that case, by the way, like there, you're just sort of imposing a standard policy. Like it's a little different than your daughter coming to you and saying, look, I really want to keep my room tidy or I really want to get better grades. Could you arrange to not, like we have a deal that you're not going to pay me if. So that's that's the difference is like the agency of the individual trying to achieve the goal, giving up something rather than being punished by an outsider. But of course, they work the same way. It's just in one case, it's a tool I can use to manage myself. In the other, it's a tool I use to manage other people. That is, that's good stuff. You know, procrastination is a barrier to change that I think everybody can at some level relate to. Can you talk about how commitment devices, and you talk about this in the book, can help us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Commitment devices can help with procrastination by giving us sort of firmer deadlines, firmer rules and boundaries so we won't keep putting something off, right? So if if I'm tempted, for instance, to put off all of my saving until next year and uh, to spend this paycheck, but I have an account that I've, I've opened where I can't actually 
dip in once money has been deposited, it's harder to blow that bank account. And I I can't put off savings because I've already committed everything that's in that account is going to stay. Students can set deadlines as a tool for avoiding procrastination in classwork. And there's this really interesting study showing that students who were given an opportunity to self-set deadlines with grade penalties actually perform better in a class than students who were not given the opportunity to set deadlines, they just had all their work due at the end of the term. Again, this is like, you know, there's a logic to why the teacher or the professor tends to set deadlines throughout the term, but we can do it for ourselves as well to help with procrastination. And in life, we, you know, you don't always have a teacher or a manager to set deadlines for you, but you can set them for yourself and you can try to actually create some penalty associated with them. There's websites where you can put money on the line that you have to forfeit if you don't achieve a goal like Stick or Beeminder, and they'll create these contracts. You can choose a referee who will report to the site, and actually, you can send money to causes you hate if you <laughs> to make it really sting. I've heard you talk about that. It's very cool, right? It's interesting because it motivates you more if you think you've got to unload it to to something you don't uh, align with. Exactly. And especially in this moment of polarization, uh, there's a lot of causes we all hate, right? (laughs) On both sides, right? And so it can be motivating to everyone to know this money is going to go in the wrong, to the wrong hands from your perspective if you don't achieve a goal. So that's, that's a way to avoid procrastination. Now that the stakes are so high, you don't put something off if you do that. You know, you sort of say one simple reason why we don't change is forgetfulness. And you talked about this earlier. And one solution for that you talk about is cue-based planning. Can you also use cue-based plans for things that you want to stop doing? Yeah, that's a really terrific question. And I think the answer is probably yes, but it's it's more of a startup device. So cue-based plans are sort of like, what is the moment when I will take this action instead of just saying like, someday I will, you know, get a flu shot or someday I will you know, go to the gym to use the workhorse example I've been coming back to throughout this conversation, you can be much more specific with a cue-based plan and it turns out follow through is higher. Like you say, you know, here's the date and time and location where I'm going to get my flu shot and then you're less likely to fail to follow through. So when it comes to cutting something out of life, if it's a thing you do too much of, like, you know, you bite your nails or you, uh, you know, nibble on snacks that aren't so good for you or, you know, something that's that's omnipresent and that you might, do without maybe conscious awareness, you could make a cue-based plan. Like at this time and moment, I will attend to this and try to avoid doing X, make sure I'm not doing X. And you're going to be more likely to remember, attend to it and try to prevent that behavior. Or if there's some program that you need to complete in order to end a behavior that's undesirable, right? Like we were just talking about quitting smoking and commitment devices, if there's a smoking cessation program or there's an exercise program that's going to help you get off the couch and, and into act, an active mode. So that's sort of a form of quitting. Then I think you can use these cue-based plans, but they are primarily studied in contexts where there's a behavior you want to execute. So if the behavior you want to execute is like making sure I'm not doing X, then I think you could use a cue-based plan. But it's, a little, it's probably a better tool in general for behavior starting rather than stopping. In just a second, we'll get back to the conversation. But first, I want to share some exciting news. My new TED Talk is out now, and it's all about the secrets to a champion mindset. For more than 15 years as a sports agent, I had a front row seat to peak performance. What was the difference between those who maximize their potential and those who don't? You think it's talent, but it's really drive. And the real magic happens when the drive to achieve is replaced by something more sustainable, the drive to get better. The best know this, that the view from the summit is nice, but it's the climb that makes it all worthwhile. Check it out. Watch it now at mollyfletcher.com backslash TED Talk. Are, are there strategies that are particularly useful to also help to get other people to change? You know, when we think about organizations, we think about leadership. Are, are there strategies in particular that you find useful in that regard? Yeah, so many, honestly. It's funny, when I first started writing this book, that I sort of imagined it as like 
60% for people who wanted to change themselves, 40% for managers who wanted to change the people around them. Although actually almost all of the research I do is in partnership with organizations trying to change individual, you know, customer or employee behavior for the better. And then the insights from that can be used for people to, to help themselves. But, but most, almost everything actually in the book comes from an organization that has implemented a test to see if a tool will be useful from helping people make plans to go get a vaccine in terms of, you know, prompting people to figure out the date and time and, you know, setting reminders to, uh, things like, um, helping employees build habits around exercise or, uh, you know, communicating about green energy programs or, you know, trying to get people to be more productive. Almost everything we've talked about, there's a straightforward application where a manager or a parent (laughs) or a coach or a teacher could deploy it to try to change someone else's behavior. So, So all the same tools really do apply in both cases. Like you can encourage temptation bundling and facilitate it. You can make it more fun to engage in an activity. You can use fresh starts as a moment when you send communications and offer up programming that's going to be helpful to people. You can prompt people to write down the date and time when they intend to follow through on something. And then, you know, you can offer commitment devices so other people can take them up or literally change incentives yourself for other people. And all of those things have been proven to be useful for the most part. You know, I loved your chapter on confidence in the book, and it seems obvious, but when we don't believe that we have the capacity to change, we don't make as much progress toward changing, right? What are some of the ways to overcome this confidence barrier, right, so that we can, in fact, believe that we can make the change? Yeah, and I'm glad that chapter resonated with you. I actually, I have to say, I don't know if you're supposed to have a favorite chapter, but um, and it, <laughs> it's your favorite chapter, girl. And that's where you're going with that. It's not like a child, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, favorite. that's good. But um, you loved that. You loved writing it. I loved writing it, and um, I love the work. And even though a lot of it isn't mine, where some of the other chapters are more my own work, this is stuff that's inspired me, and I feel like I've learned so much. And, and it was interesting to write also because I am in a field that focuses a lot on overconfidence for good reason, because overconfidence is a major barrier in decision-making to making high-quality choices. But underconfidence can also be a challenge. And I think it's actually, honestly, particularly challenging for groups that have faced discrimination historically, where stereotypes are negative. And so those kinds of things can deplete confidence further. And maybe that's part of why I find this work so inspiring, that I think it's particularly helpful to groups that you know, just aren't set up for success. Not that it's the only thing God knows that we need to do, but it's, it's you know, one thing research suggests can be helpful. So there's sort of two lines of research in here. One is the research on mindset. And the leader in thinking about mindset is really Carol Dweck at Stanford, who's done these amazing studies showing that it's important to have a growth mindset so that when you encounter a failure or an obstacle, you think of it as an opportunity to learn and grow rather than something that tells you something diagnostic about your fixed capacity and that, you know, you should give up because it's never going to work out. So the fact that mindset matters so much also is really related to research on the placebo effect that, you know, if you take a sugar pill and you believe it's going to improve your outcomes, you literally have physical improvement in your outcomes because our belief is so connected with then the actions we take as a next step. Um, these are small effects, by the way, I should say. It's not like, you know, can turn someone from a C student to an A student by just saying, like, you should believe in yourself. But they're, they're like small and seemingly robust. And there's no reason we shouldn't be uh, encouraging a growth mindset and trying to support people's confidence so that they can keep pushing hard when they they meet obstacles in their way. One of my favorite studies that I talk about, well, actually a series of studies led by Lauren Eskris Winkler from the Kelly School at Northwestern University, that the insight was that we often, when we see someone struggling, we sort of put our arm around them and offer them a bunch of unsolicited advice, assuming that we have it all figured out and we can really just, you know, that's the best thing we can do for them. And what she realized is as she was talking in her dissertation research, interviewing people who were struggling in all walks of life to achieve different kinds of goals, when she interviewed them, they actually really did have a lot of insights when asked about what would help them achieve better outcomes. They just weren't used to being asked. And uh, they found it really demotivating to be constantly sort of talked down to and offered advice. 
she thought maybe we had the script wrong and that we needed to flip it. That like too often we're just offering this unsolicited advice when instead we might get farther if we ask people who are struggling if they could advise someone else. And the thought process she had was, it's going to make them feel really good and like to put them on a pedestal and, and suggest, we think maybe from all of the time you spent dealing with this and trying to make progress, you might have accumulated some knowledge and wisdom that could help other people. So puts them on a pedestal, boosts their confidence, and that's really key. And then there's some added benefits too. Like once you're asked, you have to sort of dredge up some insights. If I need to coach someone else on how to do this, I need to figure out something to say. And you might introspect and come up with ideas you wouldn't have otherwise. And then if you coach someone else, you're going to feel like a hypocrite if you don't take your own advice. So she's done a bunch of studies and I got to be involved in just one of them, showing that when we ask someone to advise or coach other people on a goal and how to achieve it that they themselves are struggling to achieve, it actually helps the advice giver achieve more. They do better. Um, they achieve better outcomes. So we did this in one randomized controlled trial with about 2,000 students at the beginning of their second semester in high school. We just asked them to spend 10 minutes coaching. And, and we did this all digitally, like write some suggestions, tips, answer a bunch of questions about study habits that you think could help your peers do better. And the students who gave others advice, they ended up improving their own grades, both in the class they most wanted to improve in and in math which were the things that we had originally said we, we set out to try to improve. So what advice would you give someone who has tried to create change in their life, right? They failed and they've tried and they failed and they're frustrated and they feel discouraged. What do you tell someone like that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the first thing I'd say is that there is no one who has tried to create change in their lives and hasn't failed and hasn't felt discouraged. That is just part of the journey. So I do think normalizing failure is critically important and, and recognizing, like, you know, it, it's just tough, especially if you're trying to create change around a really persistent or difficult, you know, there's so many aspects of life where change is particularly hard. If there's an addiction involved, which is not, of course, the focus of my book or my area of specialty, but that, that just makes it so much harder. Uh, and then even without that, there's so much physiology and psychology working against us. So I think the first thing to say is like, you know, it's normal, it's expected. And then I think the second thing to say is, look, science actually has advanced a lot in the last 20 to 50 years on figuring out strategies and tools that can make it easier, which still isn't to say it's going to be easy, but there are scientifically proven tactics that can help make this uphill battle a little less steep. And trying to use those, trying to learn about those and put them into play may change the kinds of outcomes and how tough you find this and you may be able to do better, which is really what motivated me to write this book is that I believe that a lot of people trying to make important changes in their lives weren't aware of the science. They weren't giving themselves every possible advantage, which isn't to say, again, even with all the science at your back, you know, it doesn't make it easy then either, but it's easier. And so we can get further with that. So, so that's kind of the main message is like, hopefully this, that with some of this science on your side, you actually can make it further with another try. Can, yeah, can lean into it. You know, if a leader is introducing change inside of their organization, inside of their team, I think you can almost layer the parent hat on this too. If you're trying to create change in your children, people that you lead, people that you serve, what would you advise them to do maybe or not do? I think the first thing I'd advise them to do is not look for the one size fits all uh, approach, but try to be more you know, thoughtful and diagnostic about what are the barriers in, in the specific individuals or in the specific situations. Sometimes it'll be a common barrier across many people that frequently arises, um, but that's, that's context specific. So I, I think doing more diagnostic work is really important rather than just sort of willy-nilly trying to say, okay, there's some cool science supporting that, you know, I've heard about, maybe they heard BJ Fogg on your podcast and there's some cool stuff he's done. And like, let me just use that. I actually think that that's a good example, like tiny habits, interesting. There's lots of interesting ideas there. Definitely can be useful in some contexts, but habit is not always the solution. There's many situations where it's not a habit problem. The, the barrier to change is something else. And so just being really aware that context is going to give you better leverage to make change. I think that's that's probably the number one piece of advice. Sure. And so you should ask yourself some tough questions, I would imagine, to try to uncover 
that, what, what would, questions would you advise people to sort of ask themselves as they begin to assess the resources, the tools, the science that they can lean into to make the kind of change they want to make? Yeah, if it's an individual trying to figure out what's the barrier for them, then, you know, first is what kind of change are you trying to make, um, right? Is it to your educational outcomes, your financial outcomes, your health outcomes? Where is it? And then, you know, can you try to think through, like, what, what are the things that are preventing you from doing this? Is it that you forget constantly? Is that you hate doing it? It's miserable, right? Is it that, like, you just haven't had the energy to try to put systems in place and actually get going. So is it a getting started problem? Do you not really believe you can do it? And that's why you haven't given yourself a shot. So it's sort of like the, you know, frankly, the chapter titles in my book kind of give you the list of the most common barriers. But then depending on what the answer is to those questions, then you take a really different tactic. Right? If it's a miserably dreadful process, reminders aren't going to help, right? If, if you like, so don't don't set reminders daily if the reason that you're not you know, uh, studying for the ex- your exams is that you hate it. It's, it's not the reminder you need. You need to find a way to make that activity not so dreadful, not so hated. And, and, and But if it's just truly like, oh, I need to take my meds, but I always forget, then you need reminders, right? So there's you can just see there's a, a wide range of different kinds of barriers um, that we can come up against. You just truly don't believe you've got what it takes. You need to build your confidence and find ways to surround yourself with people who will change the way um, you see your capacity. So those are the kinds of questions that I think it's helpful to ask. Katie, you've been kind with your time. I want to hit you with rapid fire and then we'll wrap it up. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Awesome. So are you an introvert or an extrovert? I'm an extrovert. Take it back to childhood. What did you want to be when you grew up? This one is embarrassing, but (laughs) I wanted to be... I used to tell people I wanted to be a brain surgeon. I just think it sounded hard and important. And I was like, like the idea of doing something hard and important. You're kind of doing that now. I'm not a brain surgeon. Yeah, (laughs) sort of. You're getting inside of a lot of people's domes with this research. I love it. (laughs) The tennis player you would pay to watch. Oh, Andre Agassi, of course. Yeah, right. Now the balded version. You and I grew up with the uh, long-haired version. <laughs> One <take> thi- <laughs> Yeah, he's a he's a stud. One thing you're excited or grateful for right now? I'm grateful that my son is about to start kindergarten in person. <laughs> What's your favorite book? Oh, that's such a hard one. Um, I'm going to go with nonfiction favorite. My awesome. nonfiction favorite book is Nudge by... Oh, wow. um, yeah, by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. And it's really the book that opened my eyes to the way that behavioral science could change the world and got me interested in what I do today. Wow. Wow. I have not, uh, I need to check that out. What are you reading, watching, or listening to right now? Uh, I just watched The Chair <laughs> on Netflix, which is a series about the chair of an academic department at a uh fictional um, Ivy League university and the trials and tribulations of of being in academia. It's also a romantic comedy. It's fabulous. And I'm reading a new book by my friend Annie Duke that is not out yet. She just sent me um, the early copy. And I won't even tell you what it's called because it could change names. But look in 2022 for the next book by the amazing Annie Duke, the former pro poker player. Uh, And it's about quitting and persevering. And, oh, neat. Uh, it's fascinating. Wow. Neat. What an honor to pre-read that. That's, yeah, that's awesome. So that's fun. special. It's so fun. I love bet. that part of my job. I bet. And I know she's grateful for you doing it. That's cool. So the show's called Game Changers. So one last question, what game changer or who, right? What game changer inspires you and why? Okay. I mean, my number one is Ben Franklin. I mean, I'm in Philadelphia. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania and so I've gotten to learn a lot about him in the last 12 years. Just It's almost like osmosis when you're wandering the city and at this university. And oh my goodness, he is amazing. The number of things he did, I mean, from, uh, you know, making our glasses work so that we can, we can read at night to, you know, the Franklin stove to lightning rods, uh, understanding the currents, you know, forming the, our constitution. I mean, this guy, wow. He really 
pre- the postal service library systems there's so much that he's had a hand in so definitely ben franklin that's awesome that is cool i think that might be the first time we've had that that's that's fantastic katie thank you for your book i can't recommend it enough i have loved reading it it's terrific so i can't recommend it enough if people want to find out more about you how can they do that oh thank you for asking and for having me um my website is probably the best place to find out more. It's Katie Milkman, Katie with a Y, like Katie Perry, uh, <laughs> dot com. And, you know, there's information about my research center, all the papers I've written, my book, my podcast. Um, I even have a newsletter called Milkman Delivers. Yeah. Pun intended. Uh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> So yeah, that's the best place to find out more about me. Milkman Delivers. I love it. Is that your married name or your maiden name? It's my it's my maiden name and well I done, held girl. on to yeah, it. Yeah, good for you. It's too cool to let go of. I'm with you. <laughs> that's how well I felt. Done. It's a good, yes. it's a good name. Too cool to let go of. <laughs> Not so good when you're a kid, but <laughs> when you're an adult. I bet. Well, Katie, thank you so much. This has been fun. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat. I appreciate it. Here are a few of my favorite takeaways from my conversation with Katie. I love this. Number one, think more strategically about change. Here's the thing, right? Change is hard. And most people fail to change because they adopt the wrong strategies and tactics, which breaks my heart. And what I love about the way Katie talks about this is she's really a straight shooter. She's well-researched and certainly well-educated. She does not want to sort of say that there's one silver bullet or a one-size-fits-all approach for any of us. Instead, she encourages you to identify the strategies based on the change you're trying to create and the barriers that you face. Number two, create cue-based plans. You know, here's the thing. Simple forgetfulness can be a major barrier to change, right? Like we forget that we need to do it, that we forget and we're not intentional about it. You know, how many times have you said you're going to do something and then you just forget? Q-based plans can help. So when I do X or when X happens, I'll do Y. This is good stuff. BJ Fogg talks about this, who I had on my podcast as well. Number three, leverage fresh starts. When you want to change, don't underestimate the power of a fresh start. Whether it's a new year or a birthday or just the start of a new week, just the start of a new day, you can harness the power of a fresh start to disrupt routine and give you a new perspective. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at Sound On, Sound Off. Dot com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.